So, yeah, tonight is all about innovations in football injury management, followed by an expert panel roundtable debate. Um, and I thank you all for joining us. We got about 150 people signed up for this from UK, Ireland, USA, France, Spain, Italy, and Germany. And a kind of good balance of physios, sports medicine, professionals, uh, clinic owners, strength and conditioning coaches, and some university undergraduates. So quite a, quite a lot of people. I'm just checking the door, making sure. So my name's Paul Donnelly. I'm the UK Managing Director for uh, Windbank Medical. And the reason I put this shirt up here is that although we work a lot in elite sport, we also work uh, at grassroots level. And our local team whose shirt we sponsor are in the FA Vaz final uh, on some, uh, Saturday. So we're all off to Wembley. So the whole village is pretty pumped up and uh, ex excited about that. Tonight's agenda is really in two parts. We're going to be looking at an area which is a very, very kind of common uh, footballing injury, and that's all to do with the groin. It's about pubalgia, and it's about how to integrate technology and movement in rehab. So I'll introduce the speakers in a second. So Q&A on that session, if you could use the, uh, the chat function, uh, within the uh, within the Zoom uh, piece there. Just get your questions coming through as things come in, and then we'll Q&A at the end of that. And then we'll move into this roundtable discussion that we've teed up tonight. Um, again, I'll introduce the speakers, but what we're really interested in is how has this pandemic affected pro football physio practices? You know, what's happened to injury rates, what kind of injuries are people seeing that might have been unusual given the changes that people have had to go through in training practices and recovery practices. So we're going to be asking the panel to share their views on you know, just what's happening on injury rates. We'll look at, again, training and recovery, what's happening and what's happened in that area, um, how it's affected or how it's been affected by training in the in the sort of uh, the bio bubbles that people have been working and what are the challenges that have been. And then something I don't think we talk uh, probably enough about is what, how have people's mental health uh, effectively been impacted? So, you know, lockdown one was pretty seismic for everybody and then we came out of it into lockdown two. Things started to get back to a little bit of normality and then boom, we had lockdown three. So interested in how, you know, people's view and the panel's view on how they've coped with that in terms of mental health, not just the players, but the team, the coaches and the staff. We think that's quite an interesting topic. And then from a technology point of view, what technologies have really been seen to help out? You know, we believe that what we do has helped um, and we'll discuss some of that tonight. And then importantly, as a kind of takeaway uh, for the new season, what, what lessons have we learned? Okay. So let me introduce uh, the, the, the speakers tonight. So our first speaker is Ignazi de la Rosa, who's uh, the lead physio with uh, Real Betis, um, but has also worked with uh, some of the Spanish players at uh, Dortmund and has, has worked in Barca football as well. So a lot of experience in the professional footballing environment. He's also, uh, even as a, a youngster compared to me, he's a clinic director of his own practice in Barcelona called Sport Pro and was the physio for, I think, three and a half, four years for Garbin Mugarutha, who was one of the LTA, was LTA, LTA number one ranked in the world and a former Wimbledon champion. So Ignazi has got a lot of experience with windbank technology and is one of our international trainers, so... Welcome to Ignazi. Um, the second panelist, I'm sure is known to many of you. I apologize for the picture. It was the only one that we could get of you. And it's on your LinkedIn profile uh, if you want to change it. But uh, uh, Pete is head physio at GC Performance at St. George's Park. And we have a, a kind of educational relationship with Pete and the team there. And as you know, St. George's Park is... Uh, the, the contract for looking after the FA players is held by GC Performance, a, a 
SGP. Um, and Pete's bio, if I get this right, Pete was head of medical services at Witness Vikings, working with Harrison Ross in Manchester, uh, previously England Rugby League, uh, Liverpool Football Club, and was also, I think he started the career at Bolton. So uh, a long career in professional sport and uh, one of the key panelists tonight. Um, Dan Kett, who is a senior physio at uh, GC Performance also at St. George's Park, and previously at Spire Healthcare, so has a great kind of combination of MSK, post-op surgical, as well as sports uh, and football uh, sort of physiotherapy experience, and was previously at Mansfield Town Football Club, and before that at IPRS. So, Dan, you're very welcome. Um, next panelist is someone probably doesn't need any introduction, Steve Kemp. Um, a bit like Davey, who we'll introduce next, got a big, big, uh, I guess, six, six, seven weeks ahead of him as England head team physio, uh, but was also the head physio and, and the sort of liaison between the FA and St. George's Park, and really looking after the 24 England teams. So, Massive experience in professional football, previously at Worlds and still a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham. So that's Steve, and you're very welcome, Steve. And last but by no means least, uh, I've, I've said David Henderson. Is it Davy Henderson more than David? Or, you know? <coughs> There's no matter. I can be called anything. I'm not called easy. A, that's, that's great. So David's joining us. Uh, Again, as we were joking about earlier, great to see Scotland in the final stages of a big championship. Um, and, you know, a lot of uh, exciting games ahead, a lot of challenges. But Davies, uh, lead team physio in Scotland, currently a model football club. But again, a lot of experience, Sheffield Wednesday, Rangers and Newcastle United. So that's the panel. Um, and you may be wondering who we are. So I thought if you indulge me just for two to three more minutes, I could give you a little bit of background on Winback. Um, we founded this company, or the company was founded in 2013 uh, in the south of France, in Nice. And it was founded by a group of people who were working around tech and our therapy, which is going to be the subject of the first presentation tonight. So tech and therapy is that combination of manual therapy, active recovery, and you know, a high-frequency current, which is used quite extensively. But when we first came across it, it was a very passive modality. And we felt that we wanted to do two things. One, make it active so that it can be deployed through the acute, subacute, and chronic rehab phases, but also make it more affordable. So they were the two things that uh, kind of got us started and went back. Um, we're in about 25 countries internationally now, um, 7,000 clinics and, and uh, hospital in the orthopedic sports medicine hospitals. We kind of made our name in this professional sporting environment. So we probably have around 300 professional sports teams and associations that we work with. Um, and that can be in multi-sporting environments. So everything from football to rugby league to athletics to triathlon to GB diving, for example. Um, triathlon, I think I mentioned, and also laterally into areas like Formula One. Uh, so we kind of think we have a, an understanding of the challenges that you have, you know, working in that environment. Hopefully we can add some value in that area. Um, and then we kind of morphed out into two other areas. We have a business based in Asia, <laughs> in Seoul, which services the kind of Far East uh, and the US. We have colleagues joining us this evening. Um, where we had our FDA approval back in 2017, and we worked with groups like uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. We worked with uh, Johns Hopkins and a lot of the NFL, NBA, MLS teams. So, again, that sort of relationship with professional sport has been ongoing. Um, we started the UK company in 2017, so we came, we came into the UK. And we've established about 120 centers. I would say... 60% of those are within the clinic environment and 40% would be in the sort of sporting environment. And then 12 UK training centers. So you may engage with us initially, but we do a lot of our, our kind of education in a peer-to-peer -peer environment where it's a physio or a sports scientist or an S&C professional talking to you peer-to-peer -peer because we think that's where things begin to come alive. 
Um, very quickly, just a, a snapshot of, of who we're working with. You've mentioned the, the home unions, some of the leading uh, professional football teams are working with, key clinics that you see here. And then down at the bottom, you'll see places like Flint House, uh, which is the police rehab centre uh, in Oxfordshire, sorry, in Berkshire, and then Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Services, their rehab team works with us. And then also within uh, the orthopedic area, as I mentioned before, UPMC, the Whitfield Hospital in Ireland. So a little touch of you know, who, we, who we are and who we work with. And then two other things I wanted to mention is uh, the educational relationships we have with the University of Northamptonshire. Um, Brendan Skinner, who's the senior lecturer in, in that uh, area, wanted to get technology or awareness of technology into the undergraduate program. So he's, in, he's incorporated a lot of what we do into the undergraduate program. Whether people continue down that path or they don't is a, is a personal decision, but then at least they have an awareness of what's being used in the private clinic and sports medicine environments. And then the second area which we're, we're very pleased to uh, communicate is our education partnership with people who have a lot of experience. So, you know, Health Development Performance Network was set up by James Moore and Elizabeth Moore and Ken Joy, and they run, I would call, I would say, a pretty high-level training uh, events focused around the faculty that are extremely well-known and just a great partnership for us to be, uh, to be associated with. Finally, uh, a couple of things in, in just summarizing. So what we're all about is removing pain, getting people out of pain, getting them into that restoration of function by loading and movement leading up to healing their injuries faster. And our core technologies sit around techo therapy, which is the focus of tonight. Strength and conditioning, where we have a range of technologies around blood flow restriction in the, in the smart cuffs, isoinertial flywheel technologies, which are getting a lot of, uh, a lot of, kind of support and evidence base behind. And then the, what you see there in the middle, that G-move suit, is kind of an, an active normatech. So rather than having a passive recovery, uh, we're using something that's active. Uh, that's the thinking behind that. And then within screening and assessment, uh, what about UK represents the eyes of force company for eyes of kinetic assessment. And then we have our foot to go body screening, which is a clinic based uh, system whereby clients can come and take a, a health, a, a lifestyle questionnaire and then come into the clinic for a full assessment. So that's uh, a little bit about who we are and what we do. Final comments very quickly before we get into this. Thank you in advance for all your contributions. Um, we are offering up for people that engage with us and go the whole way, and you've been on this event today, and there's a 10% discount, which we'll communicate to you. We'd love to hear your feedback on future events. We're planning to run these on a, on a monthly basis. On a, on a technology of interest and, and on a, an area of medicine of interest. So if you see things here tonight, you want to know more, just reach out directly to us and uh, 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 medical.com is our new UK website. So that's my little intro. Um, Ignazi, why don't you pick up and uh, we can get into the first part of the presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Paul. Uh, thanks to the confidence that you have in me. Uh, let's go to speak today about Tuvalgia. Okay, and it's my pleasure to stay here with all of you guys, all of uh, more than 40 colleagues that we are all together tonight to speak about, about this and the technology in the sport. So let's go with the, with the presentation. So if we go to the international literature, we can find this fresh study that speak about all the terminology that we have high variation because over the years many different names have been associated uh, with injury. Uh, maybe the most common like athletic povalgia, groin pain, sports hernia, but also uh, inguinal uh, pain pelvic syndrome or hockey player syndrome, athletic hernia, uh, and a lot of this. Okay, but uh, what is really clear is that the growing pain is a common entity in athletes that particularly those engaged in sports that require specific use or of its use in that case of lower abdominal muscles and the proximal muscle of the type 
uh, involving the hip. And what we know that it's clear that if we take this the sphere of, of, a, of a watch, we can see that all these structures uh, will be affected, like the superficial inguinal ring, the rectus abdominis, the pubic symphysis, the ductus longus, and the inguinal ligament. So if we go to the scientific data, we can find uh, Gilmore that initially described like uh, Gilmore groins in the early 1919s uh, with uh, this uh, specific uh, description, okay? But uh, more or less right now after that, it's not clear, okay? But now what is accepted is that the Puvalje is a chronic groin, groin lesion. That means that people, when comes asked to the clinic or to the doctor, comes with some weeks or months of pain. Sometimes with more or less pain, depending um, on the intensity that they are doing during the matches. But uh, most of them uh, that ha they have this pubalgia have an imbalance with the ductal muscles in contrast with the abdominal muscles at the pubis that they, they have it a uh, really, really stiffness uh, with, an involved, with an imbalance of the motor control, this uh, control that increases the anterior pelvic uh, tilt that is going to increase also the tension in the insertion. So that leads to increase of the weakness of the posterior wall of the groin also. And of course, this imbalance leads to a deep groin pain. So... If we, we go to the anatomy that is relationated with, with this injury, we can find, first of all, here all the pubic area with all the insertion of muscles. This is the typical MRA that we can find with this injury. And if we go uh, more deeper, we can speak the anterolateral abdominal muscles that involve the external and internal oblique muscles, transversus abdominis and rectus abdominis with this imbalance with the tight adductors uh, muscles that is going to be really stiff, the pectineus, gracilis, and of course, the ductor longus brevis and magnus, okay? So the most important, as I said in the slide before ago, is that uh, the most important thing, if we, we do a good manage of this injury, is to maintain the stability in the sagittal plane of the anterior pelvis, okay? Because this imbalance with really stiff muscles uh, can affect the correct function of this structure and finally develop with this groin pain or uh, with, with a lot of different names, but we will uh, describe it like uh, povalgia or like athletic povalgia. So let's go to speak about the theology and epidemiology that, as I told you, there are a lot of terms that has been employed to explain these inguinal related groin pains in athletes. Uh, recently, also the British Ernest Society in Manchester uh, try to develop the uh, signs and, and different uh, symptomatology. But what is clear is that all the sports that is going to involve repetitive, energetic, uh, quicking, shooting, change of direction, uh, which all of these are risk uh, for case in Puvalgia. Athletes with Puvalgia are more predominantly male and generally under the age of 40 years because uh, most of the, the, the people that play at these uh, sports are uh, around this age and are more male than females. But of course, the anatomical and biomechanical differences in the female pelvis structure, uh, it seems that it's gonna help to stabilize the pelvic region and decrease this risk to have pubalgia. But if we go to the cases of pubalgias, the most common is, as I told you, the muscular imbalance between the ductal muscles and the abdominal uh, muscles, okay? but. Then we can find also in the scientific literature more things like rectus adductor syndrome. We can difference between an adductor and antisopathy, okay? Or also an pathology like the asymmetry of the symphysis of the pubis. We can find most of the, the dance and sports hernia, okay? That it will be comes from the myopanoratic parietal defect or an echo hernia of the abdominal wall that most of these cases uh, finish with a chirurgic intervention, but also we can find this from this uh, regional pathology, local regional pathology, that it could be relationated with nerve compression, like the obturator nerve or femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, also the genital uh, femoral nerve or a muscle disorders like uh, the iliopsoas hamstring or uh, bursitis in the iliopsoas that it's going to be also in relation with this uh, 
this balance between the ductors and the muscle group. Finally, also joint disease is that in the hip or in the sacroiliac joint could be also a, a case of, of pubalgia. And finally, some genitori, uh, genitourinary disorders. Uh, also, we can find it in the literature that is going to a case of, of pubalgia. And of course, like in all other injuries, previous injuries in that zone uh, increase the risk to have, again, uh, a pubalgia. Okay. So after this, I want to recommend you this, this scientific study, a proposed algorithm for the management of athletes with athletic pubalgia that comes from different case series and try to do a protocol to, to have a really good uh, return play uh, process. But what we know in this symptomatology, this clinical science, that most of the people that will come to our clinics with or in the team with uh, this injury, they will feel a subjective complaint of deep ground lower abdominal pain. This pain is going to be exaggerated at these specific sports, okay, like uh, uh, kicking or doing the change of direction, sprinting, they will find the, the spot with pain. Uh, most of the time, uh, palpable tenderness over the pubic ramus at the insertion of the rectal abdominis or in conjunction also with the tendon. Uh, of course, a different range of motion, different angles, they will have pain with resistant hip adductions, okay? And also when they are doing the abdominal core up, also they prefer the pain in the, in the, in the pubic symphysis. So the treatment that we uh, are doing right now is a combination with medical plus physio, but most of the times uh, the treatment, the conservative treatment, it should be attempted like the first option, okay? But uh, in line with the doctor, uh, sometimes could be that a selective corticosteroid or PRP injection into the insertion could be a good solution to decrease the local inflammation and pain. And this can allow us to start to do some specific exercises or start to do uh, some release tensions in the zone or some biologic treatment in that zone. But for example, in the case of some hernias, uh, the surgical option could be the best, the best solution. Okay, so if we are speaking that um, a physio-conservative treatment is the first option. It is necessary to speak about physio time. It's our time. So first of all, uh, it's necessary to speak that there are a really, really high difference between athletes when we are speaking about the return to play uh, timings, how many months or weeks they need until they will come back to the, to the, to the sport, to the competition. And most of the times, uh, because the, the situation that we have in the teams that they play week by week when we have an athlete with a pubalgia, most of the times we need to manage this, this pain, the functionality, and if we can keep the, the, the player in a um, pain around two, three in a scale of 10, most of the time they play for a lot of months with some pain, okay? So the first objectives that we will have or we need to have in mind is this anti-inflammatory medication in line with the sports doctor. They are the, the boss in, in, this, in this way. So in our case, if it's possible uh, going in line with the physical um, trainer also, uh, no rest if it's possible. So we will try to manage the loads to decrease the loads and try to don't stop the player 100%. For example, maybe he can do some uh, running without uh, high impact shots or he cannot kick, but maybe he can do some uh, passes at low intensity. So we will need to try to keep uh, as much as we can the, the activity. Okay, then we need to uh, start to treat soft tissue with some mobilizations, trying to decrease this stiffness that we will find in the tissue and trying to become more compliant, okay? More viscoelastic, this tissue. And the tecker therapy is gonna help us a lot in this area with the superficial and with fascia treatment. We need to uh, restore all the balance in the structure. So maybe it could be necessary some pelvis uh, manipulations, okay, to recover this with the object to recover this correct balance. And of course, with growing pain, we need to recover all the wrong or the range of motion in the joint without any, any pain. So which is the 
paper of the checker treatment with this uh, electrical transfer with these two modalities, the capacitive and the resistive. The first of all, without a lot of, in, uh, of, of temperature in, in equation, we can have this be acceleration of the metabolism only to put the tissue under these frequencies between the 300 kilohertz until the 1,000 1, um, kilohertz or one megahertz that we know that at these frequencies, we can induce the extra, the, the exchange between the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment of the potassium uh, ion. And then when we polarize this, then we will restore the correct function. Okay, so one, um, one function that in the body, it's working at this velocity under the treatment, we start to do it really, really, really quick. So for other side, it's really important to uh, have in mind the elasticity of the tissues because with the, the thermic effect, we can increase the temperature and the viscoelastic properties of the tissues uh, uh, in a deep zone. So you can see, for example, these images where we can find with the elastography recording how the tissue intervention and post-intervention can improve this viscoelastic, uh, this, this viscoelastic uh, properties, sorry. Okay, and of course, for the synaptic interruption of the receptors, we can manage also the filling of the, of the pain, okay? So if we start to speak with the wing back uh, treatment, uh, first of all, we need to prepare the tissue, okay? Warm up the tissue under ten, until the temperature that we want. And also when we start to work with capacity, as you can see in the left video, of, of the screens, what we are doing is to decrease the impedance, the resistance of the tissue in the first centimeters of the tissue. So for example, starting at 30% of the capacitive modality or at 50% of the deep uh, set uh, modality that one is gonna work at 500 kilohertz and the other one is gonna work at 300 kilohertz, we can increase the temperature after until the temperature that we want, we can warm up the, the tissue and then with the resistive modality after five to six, seven minutes, we can start to do some more uh, deep treatment doing with the saturation process from the inside to the outside of the tissue with the resistive. This is the most classical treatment, but it's gonna be really useful for the first part of the treatment. After this, we need to test how it's going to work the tissue in the strain and stress specific test. So we will feel the tissue, how it's going to be more or less elastic and the mobility of the tissue. So then we can go with this, with this specific accessory, with this fascia accessory, trying to mobilize, to increase the mobility, the elasticity, to improve the quality of the tissue of this surface tissue with this accessory going, doing these movements in the same direction of the fascia, okay? After this, we can uh, put one side or the other one if we want to be more specific or if we want to be more uh, deep in the tissue, trying to restore this functional uh, movement. And then after this, we will go, sorry, now we will go with the deep uh, fascial treatment or the soft tissue treatment also. In that case, after to prepare the tissue with the capacitive and the resistive and to restore the surface of the tissue, I will put the bracelet with the resistive modality until around 40 to 60 uh, of the percentage of, of the maximum intensity of the machine. And then I will try to go to the deep tissues and waiting to the different resistance that the tissue allow me to go deeper, deeper, deeper over the time. So what I feeling in my in my in my fingers is that the tissue is gonna relax, it's gonna decrease uh, the stiffness, and it's gonna uh, start to be more compliant, more viscoelastic, more more elastic. Okay, so we can go all to the all the spots, to the muscular spots that we can find this. Uh, this function and also that it's really really important to go between the different muscles between okay trying to go to the deep fascia and then to restore the good movement between 
the different muscles, okay? And in, and in the case that we can find also, for example, uh, and after the ultrasound examination that we have a degenerative process in one of the uh, insertions, for example, the most common is in the adductor group, we can go with the air shot to increase the temperature at least from five to eight minutes, more than 40 degrees, because with this treatment, we can increase the effect of or activate the neocollagenesis that uh, what we know for the scientific studies is that if we put one tissue at more than 40 degrees for five to eight minutes, we can increase the synthesis of the collagen type one that is the most interesting for us in the, in the correct evolution of uh, the tendinopathies. And after this reactive uh, phase that we have in the tendinopathies, try to go to the, to the proliferative phase and not going to a degenerative phase. And this is really important then to manage it with the correct exercises, with the correct strain exercises in one line for uh, heavy strain resistant exercise and in the other one for eccentric exercises. Okay, so as we said in the, in the first objectives from slides ago, we need to restore the mobility so we can introduce a protocol or a warm up uh, be before the uh, different trainings of active stretching exercises or mobility that we can use the wind back also, integrating the mobility plus the benefits of the wind back. So, for example, I will take the player. He will come with me to the to the table. I will prepare the tissue with the capacity from the deep capacity. If I feel that there are some tissues that are restricted, so I will try to uh, restore the correct function without decreasing the tone of the muscle. Okay, and then he will go to the gym with me or alone to do this protocol of different exercises about uh, mobility, uh, range of motion, active. Uh, stretching exercises, as you can see here, for example, now uh, for the hip, okay, if, or if I go from stretching, going to one side to the other one, thinking in the globality of the body that we want to put all the uh, back chain intention and trying to restore all the points that we can find some uh, tissues restricted. Okay, that are uh, affecting the correct function of the of the body. So here, for example, we are doing some active movements, trying to go more to one adductor and to the other one. I will put, okay, then some stretching for the abdominals, stretching for the psoas grab. and also internal and external hip mobility without pain, of course, but trying to go to the maximum of the range of movement, of the capacity of the joint. Okay, here you have some examples. So, which is, which is going to be the evolution of this program? So, the main goal of the therapy is to correct this imbalance, take the correct balance between the hip and the pelvic muscles, starting with the stabilizers, and then improve the function of the dynamic uh, muscles, okay? So, we need to start with this reeducation of the uh, different group, uh, adductors plus the abdominals, and also coming from a good motor control, okay, with really good quality of this movement of the low back and the transversus of the abdominis. So it's it's not the same to do a squat, that do a squat with really good motor control, that the player has the control of this hip and this low back. And if the player has this correct control and have the good perception of, the, of, his, of his body, then when we will go to the field and start to put some change of direction, he uh, can stabilize correctly with the dynamic changes of direction of, of the dynamic uh, specific uh, sports uh, movement. So we need to start to improve all the core muscles, all the hip rotator muscles, the ductors and hamstrings, of course. 
So why I do you this infographic? Here, what I want to show you is this progression that this guy, this colleague, Adam Virgil, proposes us in the case that we're, well, or where we are thinking in strength training. So in all injuries, also this one, we will start with isometric contractions at low load, okay, without uh, density. That means that, for example, five repetitions of 10 seconds. The first increase of load will be in more density of the exercise, improving from 10 seconds to until 30 seconds. Then after this, we will start with a concentric phase. That means that we will start to do some concentric exercises without pain or maximum two or three in a scale of 10 at low load and low velocity. As soon as we can, we will introduce the eccentric phase. But if we have the other two phases correctly, and then in parallel, we will improve the concentric uh, exercises until the heavy strength resistance training and the eccentric uh, training also, we will improve it first of all in load and then in velocity, okay? What is uh, really important is to understand this, that first of all, we will increase in loads and then in intensity. So that means that the evolution is will be after to put power and to put the, the plyometrics, okay? And after this, okay, or in lane, we will put the impact. That means that the player will start to run and then we will start to put some functional movements, some uh, movements that we need to think in the specific sports movements that the player uh, start to to, to feel uh, the, the injury or, or the pain. Okay, so about this, some hip motor control and some specific exercises that we can do. Okay, this is really important that the player has a really good control of his hip. For example, doing a squat without any in uncontrolled movement of his hip, okay? And doing some exercises that he can control all the time, the position, okay, of the uh, structure. Then, for example, here is the first phase where we can, sorry. Okay, the first phase that we can do the isometrics, with really good control of the transversus of the abdominis, improving uh, the exercises, trying to put a very, uh, in a very uh, slow progression, uh, some more exercises. And all of this, we can integrate it with the benefits of the fecal therapy. So that means that we don't necessarily to stay 20 minutes in the table, uh, putting the resistive modality on the tissue. We can also warm up the tissue and then start to integrate all the active exercises, all the therapeutic exercises, plus the benefits of the thicker therapy, okay? And we can start to do some of these exercises, okay? And, or as you can see here also, in the chain, some exercises with similar biomechanical uh, emphasis, okay? Here it's really, uh, really, easy exercise, okay? But for example, for football, that they have more, more of them, they have pain in the past or uh, where they are kicking, this is really useful. Of course, if we go to the literature, this is really, really useful. I think that all of you know these exercises, the Copenhagen progression, that it's gonna work really good and we can use it also in our progression of exercises or also in, in a prevention program during, during the session, okay? And after this, we need to have more or less a screening test before the return to play. So this test will consist in a, in a balance between the strength from the adductor group and the uh, abduction group that we can, uh, or the most important thing is to do it uh, objective, okay, with a gauge of, of force, uh, knowing how many needs we can do in each movement. Of course, we will need to recover all full range of motion without pain. Uh, with the physical uh, fitness trainer, of course, we need to don't have pain in the specific sport movements. Also, this go-to motor control, this good motor control, 
of the lumbar and the hip of Kern. Of, um, and finally, uh, we need to don't have pain in the adduction at different uh, range of motion, zero degrees, 45 and 90 degrees. And also if we do it at the same time with abdominal scores abs, uh, we need to, to don't have pain. Okay, so let me show you all the tests. With hip adduction, with abdominals, then going both sides, then contralateral sides, and then the other one also. And all of these tests, as you can see in the video, also the eccentric face with really good control of the hip without pain, everything. So that's my presentation. I hope that it could be, it was interesting. I think I'm go more or less in the time that I, that I have, around 30 minutes. So all, all yours. Uh, yeah, Ignazi, thank you. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation. I think it's a classic example of the progression of tachotherapy from being a, a passive, very successful treatment on the bed into something that's more dynamic and can be more widely used. So thank you for that, Ignazi. Now, if I could just throw it open to the group here and just let's just maybe take five minutes uh, questions to Ignazi on, on that particular presentation or observations or experiences you may have had. So please, uh, if you want to unmute and go for a question, Steve, I, I see you're unmuting. Just fire away your question, please. First of all, uh, Paul, if you allow me, I want to say that I'm really focused on the on the classical work that the physios uh, can do in this presentation, okay? Because I don't introduce here all the exercises that we can do, for example, in the field, okay? Sure. With the ball, uh, with all the agility drills and all of this, okay? But because the focus of the presentation also is to show how we can uh, mix and integrate all the exercise that we can do in the gym with the thicker therapy, for example, and all of this, this evolution that we set, okay? Okay, that's cool. So around the group on the call, any, any particular questions or observations that uh, you have in this area, please uh, just share away. We'll give it five minutes on this and then we'll get into the round table. Uh, Ignacy, really, really interesting presentation and th th thanks for putting that together and really nice use of, um, of, of the tech art, like, like uh, Paul said, from the sort of the passive treatment to the active stuff. Just interested on your thoughts on the sort of neuromuscular control and um, there's been some great work by um, the, well, the Sports Sanctuary Group in, in Dublin with Ender King looking at the sort of the, the cutting mechanics and, and groin injuries. Just just be interested to hear your, your thoughts of that. Do you... Do you look at that sort of mechanics, you know, change of direction mechanics and frontal plane control, and is that the sort of neuromuscular control you're talking about, or how do you go about that aspect well, of the risk? Yeah, well, well, what we are doing, or well, what we are trying to do is, first of all, to, to make an evaluation with a surface AMG, and then with this, we have the functional balance or the functional imbalance from different muscle group with different activations in a specific <coughs> exercises. Then with this, we most of the times try to work with different thresholds, for example, at 40% uh, of the maximum voluntary contraction or 50% with the inactivation of other muscle. For example, when we are doing extension on a hip, most of the times uh, the quadratum lumbatorum is too much, too much activated and the gluteus is not working enough good. So then when we go to the gym, mixing with the, with the wing back therapy, we try to focus with this and this with touch control or also with biofeedback, we try to, to fix this. Then when we are doing some biomechanical tests at high velocity, uh, when we put all the, the signs to see it then in the uh, 3D uh, reconstruction, most of the times, what we can see is that when the players are sprinting, the control of the hip is really poor. So they have some movements, and most of them, they fix it in an anterior pelvic uh, 
uh, position. And we also have a really, or we think that we have a, a start to, to having a really good correlation. Also, uh, looking what are doing all um, the, the the scientific researches with hamstring injuries, with this imbalance of the pelvic hip. So it's what we are trying to to do. No, no. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the question, Steve, and uh, thanks for the answer, Ignazi. Any any further? Questions or observations just on this whole area and how people might be approaching it? All right, great. Ignazi, thank you very much. So let's get into the questions for the panel then. So if you remember, what we were saying was if you think of all the challenges everybody's been through in the pandemic, um, you know. I'd like to kind of ask each of the each of the panel, you know, what they've seen. Maybe kicking off with you, Steve, in terms of injury profile, type of injuries, maybe things that were surprising, lessons learned, if you like. Do you want to kick that off? Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear what the, the, the guys from Game Changer uh, their experiences with the injuries they've seen this year, but. Um, I think the, the, the observations I was aware of in, in the, the early research was the stuff from Germany, which was seeing that, you know, there was almost three times um, an increase in injury rates post-COVID. So in that immediate return um, after lockdown, and a lot of those injuries were in that, the players' first game. So I think injuries were almost threefold up to, to previous levels. I think I think the rates were sort of like 0.84 injuries per game. We've been previously, they were sort of 0.3 off the top of my head. Um, so there was definitely that effect, and obviously that was from players having to do rehabilitation at home, and you know not getting that exposure to high-speed running, and, and not getting those gym exposures. Um, haven't seen the, the the research coming through from from the season, but uh, early observations, and it'd be interesting to hear if there's any sort of pod physios on the call would seem that the injury rates are up. Um, the one thing I would say is I think those who managed to survive and play regularly, I think once they were in, then the the, the density of the fixtures was so once you you know you made three or four games and got into that regular cycle of playing that you you became you had that huge chronic um, exposure to train and probably became quite robust mm. it was just the people who were unfortunate to not get that block of, of games in who then yeah. had those subsequent injuries so um yeah that, that was my initial observations we're coming into the tournament now we've got three or four players who are you know coming back from significant injuries and i'm sure um from what we're aware of other countries that they're in the same sort of position and from my previous experience at tournaments, you know, two or three we've probably usually picked up, but you know, it feels like it's maybe four or five this time who are carrying something and, and looking to rehabilitate in time for the tournament. Great, Steve, thank you for that. Pete, maybe uh, sort of pick up from the SGP experience what you've been, what you've seen. Yeah, definitely. I think kind of we've seen uh, we've been really busy, uh, kind of from the amount of players who have been trying to come in, um, which again will probably highlight kind of more injuries, but again, backing up what Steve said then as well, kind of lack of access to facilities for a lot of players as well. Uh, kind of from that rehab point of view, we've seen a lot of repeat injuries, again, off the back of, I think, lack of players access to equipment uh, to fully be able to rehabilitate the injuries they've got. I think we, myself and Dan, went through our injury data for the last uh, kind of 12 months. And kind of we've seen in last season, we saw about 7% of our injuries were hamstring injuries. And this wow. year, it's about 20% of our injuries we've seen have been hamstrings. Wow. So we've, we've seen a huge increase in hamstrings and they've often been um, repeat, uh, like reoccurring injuries uh, and then very high level ones as well, often requiring uh, surgery. So kind of that's wow. probably been our biggest uh, kind of in, like, notice of what's changed this season is is definitely those hamstring injuries again, which off the back of lack of equipment to get yeah. strong uh, and then probably congested fixtures as well. Players not having as much time to train. So again, that high yeah. speed running probably not being yeah. completed enough as well as obviously players not fully recovering in between in between fixtures as well. So that's kind of what we've noticed really. That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Well, sorry, just jumping in there. I think that's really interesting observation. I think we, we were finding, talking to a lot of um, physios um, prior to internationals, is you have to be really brave to, 
to top up your high speed running away from the games in, in the, the short periods you've got between games. So, you, you know, you've got a three day turnaround and you, you might not be picking up the usual exposure of high speed running you're getting in training. It's, it's a brave medical and sort of sports medicine team who then sort of let the manager know that they need a top up during training before they're going to go into another fixture. So I think we were definitely aware of that, that um, you know, if, you, if you don't pick it up just in the games and then trying to top up is really, really challenging. So I got the question, Pete, selfishly for me, was it be interesting any any metrics that you saw or any interesting data from the lads? We we picked up on some of our profile and where they're sort of, their sort of uh, jump height on a sort of count movement jump maintained following lockdown. But, but we did see um, generally across the board, and this is in the sort of youth football, that, that sort of eccentric mean power did seem to drop. So maybe suggesting that sort of uh, the ability to decelerate and maybe just because they didn't get exposure at home in lockdown and, you know, with a, just a treadmill, you know, they, they weren't actually getting that exposure to the decels. So I don't know whether that had any consequence with the increase in injury rates, but um, that was something incidental that we we picked up. Yeah, we, we did notice with a lot of the players we were getting in, uh, actually the our knee centric tri- um, on the Nord and the isometric test we did, which is 90-90 bridge uh, and 30 degree knee flexion, long lever bridge as well. We were often finding that the strength was actually quite good, kind yeah. of to the other side, but what we were finding was ra- the rate of force development was massively down. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind exactly. of finding that the players were been able to, obviously had the strength there, but once they did start to go to that, uh, high speed running and then sprinting, they probably just didn't have that rate of force development to be able to to cope with those those higher demands. Yeah, that's interesting. Did, did you find a relationship between the degrees of the performance of the of the jump with the counter movement jump with the central fatigue and the decrease of uh, velocity? Do, do you have the all the GPS data? Because, for example, in our case. Uh, also, we, we have this. We have a decrease on the rate of force max development. Uh, do it in a, in a force gauge. But then in the in a contact platform, we detect that uh, most of the players, uh, if we compare the data that we have in the precision of this year in comparison with the last year, they have uh, really a decrease of, 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 of explosive uh, strength. And this is for, for you said, for all the months that they stay at home uh, doing, uh, maintaining exercises without uh, high intensity exercises. Do, do, you, do, you, do you have uh, any any data of this, uh, Peter and, and Steve, about the explosive uh, exercises and the decrease of the, the performance of this? I don't know if I explained uh, enough. <laughs> No, 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 I think you did. I think uh, we haven't looked at all the metrics, but the, the, the key findings that we found of, of any interest was the, like you said, the, the, the concentric phase. They seem to have maintained that. And it was that eccentric mean power was the one that, that, that across the board, the athletes hadn't been able to maintain. Um, and I think similar to you, we, we, we saw that the, even the hamstring strength had been maintained. And we, we just do a simple isometric um, prone sort of on a Nordic. And they had maintained that. But I totally agree with Pete. I don't think they were getting exposure to that the high rate of force development or the, the stimulus they would pick up in training. And that probably fits in with the data of this these injuries of it was a ridiculously short pre-season and straight back into the fixtures. Yeah. Um, and I think one thing it has emphasised is, is and maybe from a, a governing body and the and and, and EFL and Premier League group of how we can protect that pre-season maybe going forward for these athletes because that's what they need that four to six week period of training. And yeah, we, we you may get away with it with a worldwide sort of pandemic but but moving forward we need to sort of protect these athletes I think and allow them to get that that training block in before the season starts. The last position also was really really short in comparison with other years at least in, in my team and this year for example here in Spain the the competition was really really more concentrated without the yeah. uh, rest times that we have in, in other in other uh, seasons also. Yeah just uh, very interested in you know your comments here as well. Just what you saw in your experience. Um, I think um, what the lads have said. I think the the lack of uh, eccentric strength. I don't know whether that was the thing, but in the in the month of July and August, I ended up with four players um, with need, needing knee surgery. Two a lateral meniscectomy, a lateral meniscal repair and two ACLs. 
Um, and I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, and it was just they they, they had a, maybe six weeks of training, but once we were into, and there was um, probably uh, let me think, three were in training, and one was in a game. Um, so that was four non-contact knee injuries over over a sort of six to eight week period. Um, but going forward in the in the season, the soft tissue injuries, I didn't really, to be honest with you, <coughs> the strength and conditioning and coach and the, the manager were quite good with sort of you know building them up in a sensible way. So once we get past that period, and I think Steve had said that once we get past that. I only had we had about over the season three hamstring injuries where you would normally maybe get you know more than that you know I know in the UEFA study they say you get about seven we got three but interestingly the three were all tendon tendon involvement yeah. um, so but other than you know the three hamstring injuries I never really seen a lot of muscle injuries there wasn't a lot and Steve said I think once you get going uh, you know they were physically um, the, the, once you get past that initial period, they coped with it. But the the problem was the right at the start, you end up with, with four guys with you know serious knee injuries. Yeah, um, and, I, and and I mean, you know, for us it was um, and you think to yourself, how can how can you avoid that? You know, and you know, obviously, you know, the lack of you know lack of strength. I mean, all these guys were, as I say, they were running and running and training, but. When you're when you're just getting into, and you're having maybe four, five, six months off in it or whatever it was, and then you're you know five months off, and then you're getting into that. It was a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, And Dan, it's always difficult. We'll, we'll, the next question, you'll go, you'll go first. But any any further observations, Dan, on what's been said already? One thing that uh, came to my mind just following comments on that kind of robustness that the players have got when they've actually, they're in and they're dealing with that fixture congestion. I think we were seeing a lot of not just high grade muscle injuries, but reoccurring high grade muscle injuries. And I think one thing that therapists have maybe found difficult is that transition from that rehab setting into that training setting. And players trying to bridge an even bigger gap going from training then into a congested match play with a lot of clubs dealing with a lot of injuries and therefore players that are being reintroduced into training may be going back into match play sooner than we'd ideally like. Um, so, yeah, we've certainly seen a lot of injuries that have that have been reoccurring issues for people. Mm, interesting. We've got one question here from Simon Edwards. Uh, so, I'll just read it out. So, it says, do you think that it was not actually sprinting over lockdown and then returning to sprinting too quickly that might have been the cause of the increase of hamstring injuries. Yeah, I think that's been covered by a number on the panel, isn't it? Yeah, I think we totally agree that just that specificity and then not having a long enough period to, to, to ramp up and, and build into that is, is definitely what um, I think we've seen. And, and similar with those knee injuries that Dave was talking about, that you, you can't, Again, this is the seat centre of mean power that we the, the variable that we were looking at with the counter movement jumpers. You, know, you, you can do loads of stuff in a gym and you can do lots of deceleration stuff, but really specific to football. And if you're not getting that exposure and then you ask a team to have two, three weeks to prepare and then go into a dense fixture calendar, then yeah, like, like it's already been said, it's a recipe for disaster. But I guess to, to close this kind of injury point, because I guess we covered some of the training sort of adaptations as well. But I mean, if there was one lesson. Uh, you took away from this personally, just you know, in this whole area of injury management and training. What, what, what would it be? I'll go on. I'll go first again. Sorry, but I think we talked about a mid-season break and a winter break, which we we, we, we tried last year. For me, if you were going to try and protect anything, um, ring fence, it, it would be that protect that pre-season and try and limit clubs from going away on pre-season tours. That you know, obviously that's where the finances are so important for clubs, but. Yeah. I think from a player care perspective, you need that block block of training before a season starts. Okay, thank you. Steve, Dan, comments? So the one big lesson you'd take away? I think we've got somebody who's got a lot of background noise, so I'll try and sort that out. But, uh... um, so yeah, I think from 
speaking to a lot of players, I think just maybe where we've seen players from lower leagues that have struggled to access equipment, just kind of education on the sort of exercises that they can perform. So certain players that I spoke to during the lockdown was trying to emphasise uh, where you've not able to lift heavy external loads. Can you increase time under tension for eccentrics? Can you utilise um, isometric exercises through range to try and maintain that rate of force development that obviously we, we've noted that we've been lacking in our players. So just maybe being a little bit more creative with um, some of the exercises that we've been prescribing um, to make sure that we are kind of covering all, all bases. Okay, cool. That's excellent. Uh, David, well, the one big takeaway for you over the this period in terms of, you know, what? I just, I just think we're, you know, we, we two, you're trying to go, come back uh, with, with not enough time. As Steve said, you, you know, you can do all the running and um, the sort of stuff that you want away from away from football but if you don't prepare properly um, and, and give yourself enough time to, to build up to that you, you know that's then then it's it's a you know you, you end up with problems and I think you know we've seen that right through football um, with the amount of you know like knee injuries and stuff like that you know non-contact stuff you know and I, th yeah. I think if we don't if we do it you know if we don't learn for that um, I don't know where we go That's great. Thank you for those uh, thoughts, guys. There was a lot of learning in there. The one thing I wanted to kind of, we covered points one and two, uh, and I'm just going to ask, you know, give me two seconds here, walking and chewing gum. Uh, David, could we ask, David Merlin, could we ask you to mute your uh, your phone there when we're getting a lot of background? So, one area that um, just through the panel here would be you know, we talked about lockdown one, big hit, everybody's kind of wondering what's going on, then readapting and getting some normality into life professionally and personally. Lockdown two comes along, again, slight opening, and then boom, lockdown three. In terms of the mental health side of things, um, I, know, I know none of us are psychologists, but I'm interested in, uh, was that something that you as, a, as professionals with your teams and coaches and, and people around the teams had to had to kind of confront and then what did you how did you approach it so maybe Dan kick off with you this time um, well from kind of the perspective of some of the, the players that I continue to keep in contact with during the lockdown I think just maintaining that consistency of, of communication even if it is as we are now over Zoom meetings yeah. was, was vital um, like players miss that from miss that team bonding miss that being in that environment and yeah. I think we'll all kind of testify as physios that they often tend to open up to us a little bit when they're on the treatment on the bed or in the physio room so I think having that communication even though it isn't as personal um, over your kind of your zoom calls I think it was it was still vital to to maintain players psychological health and um, certainly optimise their, from the players that I worked, optimise their, their rehab. Great, thank you, Dan. Pete, from your side? Uh, yeah, I think kind of, um, obviously, some of the players we see aren't as lucky to have um, their own facilities, really, and some of the clubs kind of share gyms with maybe a health centre or share gyms at a university or a different college or something like that, and obviously they didn't have access to those facilities, so they were either kept away from the squad to be able to use somewhere or didn't have anywhere to use. And like we, I'm sure we've all tried to do throughout this time, tried to kind of change things around, use different equipment, use yep. not the ideal for what we want. And obviously they really felt that they weren't progressing with their injuries quickly as they should have been, that they were going slower than they should. That obviously their risk of injury when they returned, they were worried about. So kind of that side of things from from my point of view, those players I was talking to about, that was a real concern for them that obviously going forward for their career, if they are out injured for 12 weeks instead of six or they do re-injure and could be out for even longer, that was a lot of concerns yeah. that I heard from the players was yeah, 
kind of just that lack of access to equipment really, really uh, they felt was hindering uh, how they were recovering really from their injuries. David, from your side, same question. Yeah, I mean, I, I just totally agree. That that's that's exactly where we were after the first lockdown, um, and then after you know there was players that couldn't, you know, even you know we were seeing them, you couldn't see them. So you're trying to um, show them exercises, what to do over, you know, FaceTime yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So that was difficult, and I think that held a couple of boys up, but. You know, our manager was quite understanding, so they they weren't. We, we once they come back, we just gave them time to, um, you know, to, to get through and make sure they were okay. So I was fortunate enough from that point of view. But the second, the when it got the, the second lockdown, the main thing was the young boys in the academy, because yeah. once our boys were back, there wasn't any problems for them. For a lockdown, they were in, they were getting tested all the time, and it was the young lads who couldn't train. I felt sorry for. Um, and they didn't, you know, they didn't know when they could come back. They're in Scotland. They can't train. They've, they've not got any. So the the coaches did Zoom calls with them, but they, you know they're training on their own. It was, um, and then they lost a year of their, uh, probably lost a year of their development. That was a big thing for these boys for the lockdown. The academy lads, and I think that that's a shame. Some of the lads, and they might never recover from that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's funny, you know, it's a very good point. You know, we've kind of tend to think of the first team and, uh, yep. and then the team but you know you've got a lot of people in clubs that are coming through and yep. you know what the heck is going on so yeah very very good point Ignazi just from the Spanish perspective that whole you know, mental health living in a bubble well you, you know that Andalusia is like a special part in Spain <laughs> that the people it's really really uh, yes <laughs> distinct really different and here the lockdown maybe uh, uh, the first one was really tough. The players uh, comes after the first lockdown really really tired, uh, and our final part of the last season was really really tough. I think that three or, or, or four more uh, matches and maybe we lose the division and go to the second division. But after this, with the with Pellegrini now with the new coach. I think that uh, this coach is doing a really, really good job because he's interacting with the, with the players, with, with the team, with some videos, trying to put some games, uh, the weeks that uh, uh, we cannot go uh, in the correct situation to the, to the field because there are one guy with, with COVID and then all the grab uh, need to stay uh, locked down for some days. And I think that they managed it uh, really, really well. But the first lockdown was was terrible yeah, yeah. because uh, the, here the authorities also tell us first of all, like, okay, this is going to be two, three, or four weeks maximum, and then we will go again to the competition. And the players were were at home uh, training really hard. And after this, uh, okay, two more weeks, two more weeks, and finally we stop uh, early uh, March. And until June, I think that we now restore the competition. So it was uh, really, really long. And that's the situation we had here. Uh, the first lockdown was uh, managed really bad. And the, the, the players uh, come to the club again to train a uh, full burnout and watch the role. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So listen, I'm, I'm conscious of everybody's time, so we're going to stick quite close to the time limit here. The, the final question, and then just maybe a wrap-up. So, were there any technologies that you know in this lockdown, or any approaches that kind of jumped off the, uh, you know, came to the forefront? Uh, just from a, a personal business point of view, we, we saw uh, a big ramp up in kind of blood flow restriction training and, and people coming on to remote courses and even players in Spain and Italy and the UK buying personal sets to try and reduce the kind of muscle loss that they might be getting. That's just a personal point. But going around the group, were there any technologies that particularly kind of shone uh, through this period? And if so, you know, just pretty sure who they were and what they were. David, you want to kick off on that one? I just think that being able to, to speak to people like this, when I was a wee boy, this was like Star Trek. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, yeah. I, th I think it was a lifesaver for a lot of people that yeah. they could communicate. Sure. 
and yep. uh, you know so you know that all this type of stuff that 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 was the big uh, the big thing with yeah, technology yeah. for me interesting interesting uh dan from your side i think again players that we were keeping in contact with during the lockdown i think there were certain um, equipment like your blood flow restriction, like use of the complex that again were were slightly different that not only we know they have physiological benefits, but players were getting that they again they they felt that they were doing something a little bit extra. They weren't just kind of mm-hmm. doing a makeshift program. They were they were using something that they felt was was really meaningful. Um so I think yeah it was a case of whatever we could utilize um we wanted to make sure we did we did so even though as as pete alluded to earlier it may not be ideally what we want to use at that phase of their rehab um, yeah, yeah. it may just from a psychological point of view and from variation point of view in terms of their their program um be be actually adding extra benefit okay great thank you for that steve reflections there anything that yeah no, no, no. A little bit similar, similar but different, I suppose, to the comments that have already gone. The, 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 um, the remote learning and the use of Zoom and the use of uh, a screen, which we, uh, so for example, we, we were doing pre training prep with, with a team and we had them all spaced out two meters apart, you know, due to COVID guidelines. Uh, and we had 26, you know, senior England men's player all staring at a, a screen and following a virtual um, SNC coach. And wow. the first time I've ever seen is every player did every part of the exercise and no one spoke to each other. They just stared at the screen. Now, if you flip that and put one of us at the front, there's no way in, in, any, in any time in my career that they'd all stare at me and follow exercise. So the one thing that we've, we've learned is you get an athlete a screen or you send them to a yoga session or you, you know, we empower them with their phone. And whether that's just the generation they are, they'll, they'll stare at that screen and, and they'll go through the exercises. So we've flipped and left a lot of recovery strategies where rather than a one on one, we'll send them the video and ask them to do it or give them some options. And I, I don't think if, if it hadn't been for lockdown or hadn't been for COVID, we'd, we'd never even contemplated trying that. Yeah. So, um, would, would even NHS wise, I think that's the way forward. Let's, you know, let's empower yeah. these patients and, and see people remotely and guide them from a distance. You know, we don't need all this passive one to one therapy. So, yeah. yeah, that's probably the biggest change for us and something we're definitely taking into the Euros of how we're going to work with the, uh, the players. Oh, but it's interesting. I think the whole everybody's business model has changed, whether it's you know what we yeah. do or what you do. And I think you know uh, a perspective. You know there were times when our team would drive up to Manchester for a meeting that might not turn out to be a good meeting. So yeah. what, what we do now is we try and engage everybody in whatever format. We'll kind of talk to them uh, in this kind of format, probably with a trainer. So let's just see: Are you really interested in this? Is it something you? Let's explain to you a little bit more of what it is, you know, peer to peer. If it connects, then fine. We can we can send you the kit. You can try it. We can educate you yeah. online. So going forward, this is absolutely going to be part of our business model. And I think all the physio clinics are the same. You know, it's just going to be a pathway that's used to, to triage you know patients through the rehab. So, Ignazi, I mean, don't want to sort of lose you on this one as well. So from your side, just final reflections on what came through for you. Some great points there on communication, Zoom, education, you know, probably players learning more about how to train and what they're doing uh, in group sessions on Zoom from the Spanish side. Any reflections? Yes, well, yes. We, we tried to use the, the Zoom with the players, for example, during the, the lockdown and also all of these. Uh, we tried to implement some new uh, strategies using technology and, and all, all the things that you, that you said, guys. But for example, uh, I think that finally it depends more about the, the attitude of each player, at least. Because you can have all the technology, you can have all the, all the instruments, you can have low floor station, you can yeah. have tech, and you can have uh, trying to communicate with, with new technologies. But finally, it's, it's a, a own decision of each player if they if if uh, in front of the complicated situations if they want to to become the best players as they can or if they want to be mid-range they'll find a way they'll find a way the champions will always find a way 
So listen, great. I really appreciate all the uh, the inputs and discussion. So let's kind of throw open to in the kind of five minutes we got left before we wrap up. Um, any any particular points that people in the audience? Uh, we still have quite a few people on the call here that you know want to ask the panel. Please just uh, use this opportunity. Um, Trying to see if. Uh, right. Well, listen, guys. Uh, firstly, my thanks for to Ignazi for preparation on his uh, presentation. It's really, really interesting, and, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. And to, to David, to Steve, to Pete, to Dan, uh, people who participated this evening. I hope you found this of value. Um, and wishing all the, the the sort of home nations guys, England, Scotland, uh, great success. Uh, don't get any don't get injured in the, in, let's get to the games and get through and one of us win it and uh, wish you a great evening and thank you for your participation this evening <laughs>